I'm joined this afternoon by Professor Leon Ndikumana and Professor James Boyce. Their new book, On the Trail of Capital Flight from Africa, The Takers and the Enablers, will be published by Oxford University Press. It is currently available for pre-orders and more details can be accessed on the links that I'm going to paste right in the description panel on the upload for this video. Leon Ndikumana is a distinguished professor of economics and the director of the African Development Policy Program in the Political Economy Research Institute here at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He previously served as the director of research and operations of the African Development Bank and the head of macroeconomic analysis at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. James Boyce is an emeritus professor of economics and a senior fellow of the Political Economy Research Institute. He is also the founder and president of Econ4. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for the time to, to, to talk to you. Oh, and I'm glad to have you, Professor James Boyce. Welcome. Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Wonderful. I'm happy to have you once again. Uh, I believe you did a good job. I only had the opportunity to read the synopsis but I look forward to reading uh, the full copy once I get it when it's uh, officially published. But let us get to uh, talk about this book and its major themes and arguments. What would you consider to be the central argument of the book? And uh, what key new highlights does this book bring to the conventional discourse of capital flight? Thank you very much uh, uh, for giving a chance to talk about the book. Um, just uh, as a way of uh, uh, setting the, the context and the background, the book uh, comes following uh, work we have been able to have been doing, uh, Jim Boyce and I and others, on capital flight from Africa and also from other regions uh, over the past four or five decades. And for Africa, we have found and demonstrated that Africa loses a lot of money uh, that it doesn't have through capital flight. Over the past five decades, we estimate that it has lost over $2 trillion through capital flight, or about 60, uh, $65 billion per year uh, since the turn of the century. And this is a continent which is struggling to meet its uh, development needs, its development goals, where poverty is rising. In fact, this is the only continent where the number of people keep rising. And now it's, it's uh, 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 countries are facing the, the difficulty of finding resources to mitigate the impact of, the, of, of, of COVID. So all those resources that are being uh, uh, smuggled out of the continent could have been good, put good use to save lives and save uh, the well-being of the, of the, of the people. Uh, this uh, in, the innovation in this book is that uh, we are now going beyond the aggregate numbers and trying to to look at at the at go on the ground and look at the mechanisms and drivers and actors enablers of capital flight using the specific cases of three countries: uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Angola, and and uh, and South Africa. The central argument of the book is that capital flight is a complex phenomenon that's driven and sustained by factors arising from both the domestic economy and institutions, but also the global system. And in fact, we, we show with examples from those countries that capital flight is facilitated by both domestic elites and corporations, but also with a very complex and tight uh, network of enablers, global network of enablers, including bankers, accountants, lawyers, and who facilitate both the movement of capital flight from capital from Africa, but also the concealment of capital flight of capital from uh, it, once it reaches those destinations. Mm -hmm. So we also uh, demonstrate that. Uh, capital flight is, in fact, one mechanism of what is generally called or traditionally called the resource curse, whereby a country actually, instead of benefiting from own, having 
being blessed of having resources is actually suffering negative consequences of the way those resources are mismanaged. In the case of, of the, of, uh, in, it, it so happens that the, all three countries have vast amount of resources. Angola is one of the, the, the top producers of oil in the continent. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is the, probably the global leader of cocoa production, accounting for over 45%. South Africa is one of the uh, richest countries in terms of mineral resources, also the most diversified economy. But you find that in, in those all these three countries, they have failed to, to take advantage of those resources. In, 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 in Cote d'Ivoire, the farmers, are, are, many of them live below, below the property line. Yet there are many uh, Ivorian elites who have benefited from this, uh, from this bounty, but also it has benefited uh, uh, international corporations that are, that are exploiting and uh, uh, exporting, uh, exporting cocoa. So you have a, a collusion between the, the, the national elite and, and, and the global capitalists. In the case of Angola, it's a case situation where the oil has benefited the, the national elite, including the president's family, the former president's family, and, and, co and, their, and their corporations, but also international corporations that, that have invested in, in, in the sector, uh, and banks that have financed the, 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 these, these investments. In the case of South Africa, we have a, uh, shown how um, the capture of the state, basically, in this public sector, has been a source of enrichment of individuals and corporations, again, facilitated by, by enablers such as bankers and uh, accounting and auditing firms that sometimes work on, for both sides. So in, in both cases, in all three cases, you find that the ordinary citizen is not benefiting from the, from the country's wealth, is the top elite that's benefiting from, from, the, from, the, from the riches of the country, but most importantly, the global corporations, multinational corporations operating in those, in those resources. So again, it's a, it's, a, it's a book that demonstrates that the uh, massive hemorrhage of finance, financial resources that have demonstrated at the, at the aggregate level, is actually explained what's, by what's happening at the at the local level, at the, at the at the country level, at the sectoral level, at the institutional level. That's that's the, what we hope that the readers are going to be enjoy enjoying in reading this book. As a kind of shorthand way for expressing our central argument, I would add that we we coin a phrase to describe these international networks that are are um, discussed in the book and in the case studies of the three countries. We call them transnational plunder networks. And I think that's a, an important um, piece of the puzzle to keep our eye on, um, whatever one calls them. I think transnational plunder network is actually a pretty good name for it. The key argument is that um, this problem is not one that can be um, identified as caused solely by a few bad actors, a few kleptocrats in Africa, or a few um, multinational corporations who are cutting corners in order to make an extra dollar. What we have at work here is really a transnational alliance of individuals and institutions who benefit from this massive extraction of wealth, of loot from uh, Africa. And in order to tackle the problem then, what we need in a similar fashion is a transnational alliance amongst all of the people who suffer from that activity. And the people who suffer include not only ordinary Africans, working people in Africa, who see their wealth extracted and their states weakened by not only the corrosion of the rule of law, but also depriving the state of tax revenue in order to provide public goods and services that the people need, but also in the developed countries, in the destination countries, the countries that are on the receiving end of the looted capital, we identify a number of ill effects as well. And so our argument really is that rather than see this as a purely national problem or a purely regional problem, 
or a problem of North versus South. We need to see this as a transnational problem in which a small group of economically and politically powerful players manage to benefit themselves and benefit each other at the expense of the vast majority of people all around the world. Why should we care so much about capital flight? And who are these so-called enablers? I think answering that question will help us to find a way in, uh, in uh, uh, addressing this problem of capital flight. Because if, if, the, if capital flight remains conceived as the problem of developing countries that are not able to manage their resources, that whose governments are not very capable of running their economies, I think the, the world will be missing an opportunity to tackle a severe problem, because it doesn't only affect African countries, but also has severe negative effects on on even in the economies that are actually are hosting those those resources, which we also, uh, which is well discussed in in some of the in the chapters in the book. So why do we care about capital flight? Uh, as uh, again, as a as a matter of context, we have in our previous work, we have been able to show that the funds that leave African countries through capital flight could have ameliorated Africa's progress uh, uh, development uh, record if they were invested, retained and invested in the, in the, in the, host, in the host economies. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, they, we have um, in, our book, in our 2015 book, uh, uh, one of the chapters demonstrated that African countries would have been able to grow faster if they had retained the capital that had fled the country through capital flight. They would have reached higher growth rates, which would have been able to help them accelerate poverty reduction. In fact, many countries who have been able to reach the, 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 the Millennium Development Goal of reducing poverty by half in, by 2015, if the, in fact that, revenue, that, that money had been invested in Africa. In our previous work, we also have seen, have shown that capital flight being funded by, partially by, by money, which is it was borrowed abro uh, uh, from abroad, they were supposed to be investing in the country, ends up actually undermining African economies in many ways, including by the fact that the money that's generated by these economies that could be invested in building infrastructure, building schools and hospitals, ends up being used to repay the loans, which actually have not been invested in, in these countries. So uh, infant mortality would have been lower if African countries will have been able to invest that money. So in a, in a sense, we could say that the, one of the costs of capital flight is more kids dying unnecessarily because of lack of adequate health care. Mm -hmm. The cost of capital flight is children not being able to go to high school because they don't have enough space in the, in the high schools. Mm -hmm. The cost of capital flight is the fact is, is kids not being able to go to university because the governments don't have the money to subsidize higher education or to at least provide loans, subsidized loans for, for, uh, to, to students, which is not existing in, in African countries. So there is a human cost to capital flight. And that's why we care. Because the other way uh, also to look at it is Money that's leaking out of African countries would have been able would have been able to fill the financing gaps that we see emerging in all sectors. African countries have are facing large and, and growing uh, gaps in the ability to finance energy provision, infrastructure, road infrastructure, and all that. So those gaps could have been filled if African countries would have, have been able to to retain that those resources, and in doing so. African countries will have been able to be in a position where they reduce their, their borrowing from the rest of the world. So they will be less indebted to the rest of the world. In fact, we have demonstrated that if African countries were able to, re, to, re, to repatriate even a fraction of the, of, the, of the wealth accumulated abroad through capital flight, they would basically expand their debts and be able to, to finance their development uh, programs. So therefore, uh, capital flight is a concern for African countries because it retards development. It keeps African countries in bondage vis-a-vis -vis their, their foreign uh, 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 creditors because they can't pay their, 
pay all their loans. In fact, if they had the, this money invested in, the, in, in their own country, they will not have to depend on aid. They will not have to depend on, 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 on foreign, foreign, uh, foreign loans. So um, capital flight has, is a concern for both economic reasons, human reasons, social reasons, but also in, uh, moral reasons, uh, uh, because it benefits to the elite to the detriment of the poor. And I keep saying that maybe one of the reasons why we don't have enough investment in, in social services like education and health and, and, and so on mm -hmm. is because the elite, which is in control of the policies, doesn't actually pay the cost, suffer the consequences of underinvestment in education and health because they are able to send their children abroad. They are able, mm -hmm. able to go source the, the, the health services abroad. So that creates more, uh, in, it increases the gap between the poor and the rich. And it, that's another reason why we, need, we care about capital flight. Yes, uh, I think uh, Leonce has hit the nail on the head in terms of why, uh, particularly from the perspective of Africa's development, this is such a crucial issue uh, with its negative impacts on growth, investment, uh, public uh, provision of goods and services, including health and education, uh, investment in infrastructure, and also its impacts in exacerbating inequality, not only in the distribution of income and wealth, but also inequality in the distribution of political power. Capital flight helps to consolidate the very inequalities and narrow control of the state that on the other hand, facilitates capital flight. There's a, there's a certain kind of vicious circle at work here where inequality and capital flight feed each other. I would add to these effects that we can see some similar effects as I alluded to earlier in the destination countries. You know, one might think, well, all the capital being lost in Africa, that's increasing the amount of capital in my own country, the United States or in the UK or France or other destination economies, and therefore they are benefiting. As a whole, these economies are benefiting at the expense of Africa. And I think that is uh, to a large extent not the case. It's not the case that the economies of the US, the UK, France, and so on benefit, uh, that the people as a whole benefit from this influx of looted resources from Africa. Perhaps that was once the case back in the era of colonial rule, but today the people who benefit are really a very narrow elite and they're, at, they're a multinational elite, not just a national elite, and they benefit at the expense of the vast majority of people. They benefit economically and they benefit politically. So here in the US, for example, and in other uh, metropolitan powers around the world, one very clear effect that we can see that we write about in the book is the impact on real estate markets in the global cities of the world, in cities like New York and Paris and London. What we see is a massive influx of dark money, of money that's coming from offshore shell corporations whose owners remain in the shadows, deliberately concealed with the enablers, of course, charging and picking up a nice margin for providing that secrecy service. And that money then flows into real estate markets and bumps up the prices of real estate, starting at the high end real estate, the most expensive places, and then trickling down through the entire real estate market. And that inflation of real estate prices and the conversion of these cities of the world into playgrounds for a corrupt global elite comes at the expense of the ordinary people and working people who live there, who can no longer afford to pay, not only can't afford to buy uh, apartments or residences, but actually can't even afford to pay the rents to, to, to obtain housing in the most uh, desirable central locations in their own cities and therefore are pushed out to the margins of the cities where they suffer from longer commute times and worse, uh, worse living conditions overall. So those are direct impacts that the welcome mat that countries like the United States have thrown out 
to dirty money from around the world, these are impacts that that welcome mat has on ordinary Americans. And they aren't positive impacts, they are, they're deeply negative impacts. At the same time, the corrosion of the quality of institutions, in particular in the financial sector, and the undermining of the rule of law is something that isn't contained within national or regional borders in Africa. That spills over around the world. And in fact, to some extent, what's really happened is it's spilled over from countries like the US and the UK and France into Africa. It's an international corrosion of legitimacy and rule of law. So the same institutions and the same enablers who assist capital flight uh, from Africa also assist in tax avoidance and tax evasion by citizens of the United States, the UK, France, and so on. Their citizens also use the same networks of offshore tax havens and enablers that are used by the elites, the political and economic elites of so many African countries. So this again is really a transnational problem which uh, needs to be addressed as such rather than misidentified as a particular problem just of African countries, for example. Uh, th this book pays particular attention to Angola Cote d'Ivoire and South Africa. What would you consider to be the central significance of these case studies with regards to capital flight? Yes, the book, as I said, is, an, uh, is our first uh, step into going micro, going uh, at the country level from the aggregate analysis we have, we have been doing. Uh, obviously, if we had an infinite amount of resources, we would have done 54 case studies. <laughs> but we don't. So we were um, uh, led to select uh, three case studies, which we think are quite meaningful in representing the issues that we are, we are discussing here, which is the massive amount of capital flight. These are three countries that emerge on the top of, uh, of the list of African countries in terms of capital flight. Uh, South Africa has lost over $300 billion over the past four, five uh, decades. Um, Angola, more than $103 billion. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire, more than $55 billion. But also, these are countries that are, are big in terms of economic size. I think uh, Cote d'Ivoire is, is one of the biggest, uh, probably the biggest economy in the, in the region, uh, the CFA region. South Africa, of course, is, is the number one, number two, number three economies in the world, in, in, in the continent, depending on which measure you use, but more, certainly the most diversified. And Angola is also a large country and a, a, large, a large economy. But also these, all these three countries are very rich in terms of natural resources. And it, our analysis does demonstrate the phenomenon that I in, it described of, of resource curse, where there is a failure of, of leveraging the massive amount of resources because of, bad institutions, bad decisions, and, and also uh, in the fact that some, a small group of elite and corporations are able to capture the, the sectors, the, the, the vital sectors and enrich themselves. Uh, in the case of, the, of, of Cote d'Ivoire, for example, a top producer of, Cote of cocoa, one of the things, one of the issues we had is even tracing the trade of, of cocoa, finding how much co cocoa is Ivory Coast exporting to who, and we just can't reconcile the numbers, which means that uh, there is money, there is capital being lost through trade misinvoicing of those, mm -hmm. of those, of those products. Mm -hmm. A phenomenon that we also find in the case of, of South Africa in terms of minerals, gold, platinum, and, and, and so on. But at the same time in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, as I said, even though the country is one of the top producers of cocoa and cocoa is a product that generates many, many additional uh, products that people use on a daily basis, chocolate and all that, uh, the farmers are not getting the benefits of the, of the price booms uh, because their salaries is a small fraction of the final product. And the, the, the benefits accrue to the intermediaries and the, the, the corporations that are, that are exporting those, uh, those products. In the book, we, we, uh, uh, there's a, a very detailed narrative about how the cocoa sector was 
parceled out and owned and, and distributed as bounty to the political supporters, to, to politicians, the, having uh, having monopoly powers to 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 export export cocoa. Therefore, the benefits of cocoa production and and processing accrue to those who have those monopoly powers, which are politically determined. In the case of Angola, it's basically the 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 the, the, the presidential family that control the whole uh, the whole sector and uh, you you uh, the book will will uh, uh, illustrate how uh, the, the daughter of the former president became one of if not the top the, the richest uh, woman in on the continent but among the among the richest and that's all from capturing the the rents from the oil uh, through um, serving on the on the on the national on the national oil company and creating their their own uh, companies in offshore financial centers. So the wealth is extracted in Angola, but also it's but actually it's intermediated abroad. Therefore, the Angolan economy does not get the benefit of the resource of the revenue generated from from natural resources, uh, and that's another 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 ways in, in which wealth is uh, is exported abroad, but also uh, the, the country suffers from from negative consequences. In the case of, of Angola, in fact, the oil boom doesn't benefit the, 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 the regular the ordinary uh, Angolan in terms of revenue, but also undermines other activities in the sense that the Angolan currency becomes too too expensive. It's impossible to read to live in Angola in, in, in Rwanda if you are an ordinary citizen, even if you work for the oil companies, because the, the cost of living is so high. In the case of, uh, of South Africa, we narrate the case of uh, the uh, illustrations of what is called state capture, where private individuals and companies are a, a actually able to, int to in infiltrate, I would say, the state system to, to hold hostage the decision makers because they have mon monetary and economic and, and political power mm -hmm. to even influence who gets nominated to be minister of this, minister of that, and they Control who gets access to contracts with these with, with these uh, with the, with the state companies because one of the key sources of enrichment in in this in this uh, in this case is being able to get uh, juicy contracts with either the central government or state uh, state uh, owned enterprises where prices of material are become inflated so that the revenue, I mean, the cost be, become inflated and then so that the revenue and the profit uh, is, is, um, is increased. But that, rev that revenue is not taxed, is not uh, um, intermediated in, in the economy because it goes into secrecy jurisdictions. So in a sense, uh, you have a, a, a combination of wealth, natural wealth, bad governance, uh, corruption and greed that basically sustains wealth extraction in the form of that generates capital flight and sustains capital flight. Another important thing that we, we, we demonstrate in the case of, uh, of South Africa is the limit of economic reforms in as a, as a means of uh, of preventing capital flight because the South African government did. Um, uh, launched a massive uh, effort to undertake uh, a market-oriented economic reforms in all sectors. They even uh, established um, uh, policies to facilitate repatriation of capital flight, uh, notably tax amnesties and so on. But our analysis, the data we have show that the, the, the benefits from, from those, those market-oriented reforms were not as, as uh, didn't live up to the, to the expectations basically because there were still opportunities for people to ex expatriate, export ca uh, capital from, from, the, from the continent. In fact, liberalization meant that people were not now able, to, the, the capital uh, holders were now able to, uh, to uh, invest their, their, their capital abroad. Uh, for example, listing corporations on the, on the, on the, on the, on the London Stock Exchange instead of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So mm -hmm. liberalization did not yield the, the, the expected benefits. In fact, it made the wealthy wealthier and it made the poorer poorer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the, 
that's the 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 sad story of mm -hmm. capital flight in countries which are rich. In fact, in some of the of the media reporting, you have seen uh, cases where South Africa is portrayed as the most unequal uh, country in the world. I think it's a little bit of, of an exaggeration. I have seen more inequality in other countries, but still, it has a lot high high inequality, even though it has massive amount of resources that could be leveraged to reduce that poverty and, 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 and limit reduce inequality. Wonderful. Let me hear from Professor James. Is this much more of a phenomenon of resource-rich countries or resource-poor countries? Well, I think, you know, as, um, as Leon said, uh, ideally we would, have, we would like to see similar kinds of detailed case studies um, of every, every country uh, in the continent. And we chose these three because uh, they're all in the top 10 in terms of the total volume of capital flight, according to the estimates we've developed. And um, also, they have certain differences in terms of their histories, uh, different colonial uh, rulers in the past, uh, different uh, resources. Uh, they're all rich in resources, but in different resources. Um, and yet, we find these similarities. Um, in all places, we find the operation of uh, what we call the transnational plunder networks. Mm -hmm. um, and in all cases, we see something else that I think is worth bringing out about the way these networks operate, which Lance has just alluded to, which is the fusion of power in the market with power in the state. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of political debate ever since the 19th century around the world has been framed as the state versus the market with you know, one side thinking, oh, the state's gonna solve all our problems and the other side thinking, no, the state is the problem, the market will solve all our problems. And the reality is that in a way, you know, there's some interesting technical issues in terms of the division of labor between states and markets. But the underlying reality is that regardless of how an economy is structured in terms of the division of uh, labor, so to speak, between the state and the market, as long as a narrow elite occupies the commanding heights of the economy and of the state, and those tend to go together, um, you're going to get outcomes that are not uh, terribly uh, attractive from the standpoint of the vast majority of people. And you will get the phenomenon of elites using their political power to leverage power over markets, as Leonce alluded to, for example, in the case of the cocoa trade in Cote d'Ivoire. And you also see the use of uh, uh, market power to leverage power over the state. And so rather than thinking about the central issues of our times as being hitting the right balance between the state and the market, we think the key balance to be struck is between the power of the people, the power of working people versus the power of narrow elites. That to us is the, is the central issue. Now, you asked Anitoda about the, the, whether it's a more severe problem in resource rich countries. And I suppose how one answers that question um, depends a little bit on how you measure the severity of the problem. Certainly mm -hmm. in terms of the magnitude of capital flight, in terms of the sheer amounts of money being extracted uh, being a research, resource rich country um, is associated with more money being extracted. In most cases, there are some exceptions, of course, but we find that problem, uh, that pattern, pretty systematically, not only in Africa, but around the world. This, it's an element of what Leonce alluded to at the beginning, sometimes called the resource curse. The paradox of plenty is another word for it, that countries with a lot of resources find themselves attracting predators who loot those resources in alliance with local allies who are given a piece of the spoils. And so um, by that measure, by the sheer volume of, of resources extracted, it's a bigger problem for the resource rich countries. On the other hand, does that mean it's not a problem in resource poor countries or in countries with lower per capita incomes? I wouldn't 
go quite so far as to say that, because even though the scale of the problem may be smaller, the ability of people to withstand the effects of that problem are weaker. And where you don't have as much in the way of natural resources, sometimes what you get more of is external resources coming into the country in the form of um, external assistance, official development assistance, and in the, firm, in the form of loans from uh, private as well as uh, public banks. And that external flow of resources is in a way similar to natural resources in that it's a very lootable sector. Our previous book, um, Africa's Odious Debts that we mm -hmm. published 10 years ago, mm -hmm. goes in specifically to the linkage between external borrowing and capital flight. And what we find is a very tight linkage that a substantial fraction of the funds that are borrowed abroad are spun around through what we've called a revolving door and wind up back in sometimes in the very same banks that lent the money, certainly in many of the same countries that were lending the money. And so the people of Africa are left with the liabilities, but they don't have the assets that, can, that should have been created by the proper investment of those borrowed resources. So is it more of a problem in resource rich countries? I would say the jury's probably out on that. You know, having a lot of resources is certainly not a panacea for, for all that ails a country. It can bring a whole host of new ailments. But at the same time, um, being a resource poor country is not a particularly desirable condition to be in either, particularly if you end up with a predatory international system uh, operating at the expense of people even in the poorest countries of the world. What has been the situation around capital flight in the world economy broadly? Well, the situation has changed uh, a lot since I started working on this um, many decades ago. I first got into working on the topic of capital flight back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s when I was writing a book about the Philippines and about the looting of that country under the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos. And when I learned that the Philippines had an external debt of many billions of dollars for which there was very little to show for it in terms of improvements in people's livelihoods at home in the Philippines. Um, at that time, uh, capital flight was almost a taboo subject in the so-called international community. It was a subject that you did not mention in polite company. Of course, everybody knew there was something going on. People would talk about it in whispers, but they would never, or at least very rarely, talk about it openly. It was not a good career move for an economist to be writing about capital flight because it was, it was considered an embarrassing topic that really was one that we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't uh, focus on. That's changed a lot, uh, partly I think because of the end of the Cold War, a lot of crimes were swept under the rug in the name of the superpower rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union. Um, the phrase that was um, apocryphally at least used by um, Henry Kissinger describing uh, the dictator of Chile, Augusto Pinochet, that well, he may be a son of a bitch, but at least he's our son of a bitch. That kind of thinking was, uh, was pretty widespread, I would say, amongst the most powerful rulers of the, um, of the rich countries of the world. Um, and they were willing to overlook a lot of crimes by, by, by people like Mobutu in, uh, in uh, what's now called the DRC and so on, right? So the mm -hmm. end of the Cold War, it, it began to be possible to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. And you began to see increasing interest in the subject, particularly in the international financial institutions, including, I would say, the World Bank and the IMF, because the private sector banks were no longer lending to mm -hmm. developing countries or weren't lending much. And they were left as the main source of loans, these official institutions, and yet the money they lent was spinning around to service the debts that had been contracted in the past, and again, spun around into capital flight. And so 
people began to talk about this issue more. And of course, there was more advocacy on the ground as well. There were courageous activists uh, in uh, the countries of um, Africa, Latin America, and Asia who began talking about this issue and pointing to this issue, uh, began getting more attention in the press. And I say courageous because in drawing attention to these things, they risked incurring and in many cases did incur the wrath of the ruling elites in their countries. And they were helped by international NGOs who began to understand that this was a key part of the problem of development and inequality around the world. So things began to change. Um, even in the 1990s, you began to see the first treaties for mutual legal assistance. These are treaties by which countries are able to uh, request uh, help from each other in investigating and prosecuting financial crimes so that countries who have been, which have been looted when a new government comes to power and wants to try to recover that loot, they were able to get some legal cooperation from uh, the countries where the, the loot was stashed. Not perfect, but it was progress. At least a framework existed for these things. Financial intelligence units were created around the world to, uh, to assist in that process of preventing um, further looting and capital flight and recovering stolen assets. Again, not perfect, but at least you saw being put in place the nascent infrastructure for trying to get to grips with this problem. If you fast forward into the, the 2000s, back in 2007, uh, Leonce and I participated in a conference held at the Reserve Bank of South Africa in Pretoria, at which um, people came together from around the continent and from some of the international institutions as well, including the World Bank and the IMF and the Reserve Bank of England and so on. And we spent several days discussing the problem of capital flight. And at the end of that discussion, uh, we all agreed on a declaration. There was a declaration issued. It's, it's published in, in, the, in, an, in an appendix to our earlier book, Africa's Odious Debts, where uh, the signatories acting as individuals, not as institutions, agreed to a set of common understandings about the magnitude of the problem and the urgency of addressing it. That same year in 2007, as it happens, the World Bank and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime launched something called the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative or STAR Initiative that put in place infrastructure to try to assist countries in recovering stolen assets. So these are all major changes. I mean, these are things I have to say, if you told me back in, in uh, you know, 1991 and 1992, when I was writing on this in the Philippines, that all of this would be accomplished over the next 20 years, I would have said, that's, that's, that's a lot. Now, that said, there's still many miles to go, right? This is not a solved problem in, in any way, shape, or form, but mm -hmm. progress is being made. One of the most difficult places to make progress, I would have to add as a, as a citizen of the United States, has been my own country. The US has not been a leader in efforts to uh, address these problems. And in many ways, it's played an obstructionist role. I mean, back in the 90s, the Clinton administration was involved in negotiation with the other OECD countries over an international agreement that would have made it easier to track um, money going into offshore havens and easier for countries, uh, including the countries of the OECD, to combat tax evasion and tax avoidance. And when the Bush-Cheney government came to power um, in um, the early 2000s at the turn of the century, one of the first things they did was pull out of that agreement and basically sabotage it. Famously, uh, the Treasury Secretary at the time said, uh, we don't want to make it easier for countries to tax their own citizens. Can you imagine a Treasury Secretary, that's what's called a finance minister in most countries, whose job is precisely to oversee the collection of revenue for mm -hmm. the state budget for the exchequer, saying we don't want to make it easier for countries to tax their own citizens, but that's what they said, right? Mm -hmm. um, this, this reflects the power of um, the vested interests in the financial community mm -hmm. and in the economic elite in the United States. But 
progress, some progress has been made too. I mean, one of the turning points again came through international politics in that after the September 11 attacks, um, the US passed legislation called the Patriot Act and inserted into that legislation, thanks to the efforts of leaders in the Senate, like Senator Sarbanes and Senator Carl Levin from my home state, Michigan, um, you had language that um, began to ramp up the activities of what's called FinCEN. It's the Financial Intelligence Unit uh, for the United States housed in the US Treasury and enhanced their ability to track financial flows, enhance the reporting requirements for banks. Banks were required to file suspicious activity reports when monies came in, the provenance of which was not transparent or the ownership of which was not transparent. Now, that's progress. Again, it wasn't a solution. The banks filed these reports. Uh, FinCEN is totally underfunded and understaffed. And by filing the report, the bank gets, you know, hopes to waive its legal liability should their malfeasance ever come to light and then proceeds happily in all too many cases to launder the looted money. But at least those institutional mechanisms are being put in place. And we still have people um, pressing in the United States for more progress on these fronts. Uh, one of the great leaders being uh, in the US Senate today, uh, the Senator from, from my adopted state, Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, who is um, really played a key role in trying to increase transparency and accountability in the financial sector. So in sum then, I would say um, internationally, we've come a long way over the last 40 years and we still have, or 30 years, and we still have uh, quite a way to go. But there is, the, the good news is there's been progress. The bad news is uh, not enough progress. And what that means for all of us, including your listeners, is that we've got a lot of work to do. But if we do it, we can score some victories. We can, we can address this problem. It's not hopeless. It's not beyond our control. There's an active struggle going out there between the people of the world and the transnational plunder networks. And um, as part of the people, we can be on the right side of history in this struggle. Thank you so much. I like that uh, there is a lot of work to do. Now, my last question for you, Professor Leon, how best can national governments and multilateral organizations reduce the rate at which capital flight occurs in the continent? I would actually build on, on the excellent uh, historical overview of the process of trying to institutionalize mechanisms for fighting capital flight. Uh, we'll build on what uh, Jim has, has, um, has narrated and say that uh, the good news is that there are some institutional mechanisms that have been uh, established at the global level, at the, at the continental level also, and the national level. So, um, and then the question is, how do you leverage those mechanisms? So, for example, at the global level, as, as Jim has indicated, now we have a UN uh, target of reducing illicit financial flows, uh, SDG 16.4. We have the OECD that has uh, is now leading the effort to find a way of curbing tax evasion by my by multinational corporations. Uh, in the Africa, uh, on the Africa side, we have the high-level panels that was established in 2012 and is uh, leading the discussion and debate on uh, strategies for, to curb capital flight. The United Nations Economic Commission for Africa is here. Is, uh, coordinating that, facilitating that effort. The United, uh, the African Union is behind that effort. And at the national level, I think there is pressure to accelerate progress in terms of fighting and combating uh, corruption, but also now looking at specifically at, at the issue of financial uh, uh, intelligence units, which could be beefed up to, re, to, uh, to track illicit financial flows, to track inflows and outflows of, 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 of funding. So what's needed again is to, first of all, start from the premise that the solution to capital flight cannot just be a national solution. It cannot be a local solution. It has to be a combination of co coordinated effort at the national level, at the regional level, and at the global level. And unless big governments, 
governments of big countries, uh, powerful countries like the US, France, UK, and so on, take it seriously to discipline their own corporations and, in, and require that they are transparent in their transactions, in their financial transaction, trade transaction, that they pay taxes where they, where, they, where they have their activities. It's not going to be possible for African governments to build the capacity to actually track down capital flight because you actually need to build technical and human capacity to uh, track down trade and finance. And for that is going to be to require government to be able to better mobilize their own domestic revenue. And that will require that they're able to tax uh, co uh, multinational corporations. The other uh, uh, important uh, area is building research capacity in the, in, in the countries so that they can, uh, can, can do the kind of analysis that we are doing so they can feed the work of civil society organization, which is another point I wanted to make, which is strengthening the capacity of civil, social, uh, civil society organizations, which are very good at uh, being the voice of the people in, in, uh, in uh, uh, identifying areas of corruption, lack mm -hmm. of transparency, lack of accountability, so that they can demand their own governments to be more transparent, to be more forthcoming about what resources are being exploited, who is investing in those resources, how much rents are they paying, how much taxes are, 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 are being paid, and hold accountable those who break the rules. And so a vibrant a civil society, a, a, a strong media are, are the voice of those citizens, and they are, they, they are, they are needed to to leverage the research that we're going to be uh, produced by, the, by, by academia so that that research can feed into the, the uh, policy debate. Because if, if I look, even if I look at the case of the UN uh, uh, resolution to adopt the SDG 16.4, uh, that was fed by discussions that leverage the research that we are doing and other people are doing on capital flight and illicit financial flows. So research and policy advocacy have to, have to go hand in hand. And financing research in that area, financing capacity building in that area will actually add value to, to aid effectiveness. If, if, the, if development partners want to really be effective in supporting African countries, they should put money in beefing up the capacity to combat capital flight. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, viewers and listeners, uh, this was Professor James Boyce and Professor Leon Dikumana. Their new book, On the Trail of Capital Flight from Africa, The Takers and the Enablers, will be published by Oxford University Press, and it is currently available for pre-orders on the links that I'm going to paste right in the description panel on the upload for this video. Leon Dikumana is a distinguished professor of economics and the director of the African Development Policy Program in the Political Economy Research Institute here at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He previously served as Director of Research and Operations of the African Development Bank and Head of Macroeconomic Analysis at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. James Boyce is an Emeritus Professor of Economics and Senior Fellow of the Political Economy Research Institute also here at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is also the founder and president of Econ4. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being on this show and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so us. much. Wonderful. Have a good day.